so many stupid parodies you can make from this. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and here in the studio is just me, except that I'm joined by a brother from the motherland up north, uh, Nick Fournette, aka King Boss Squad. How you doing, bud? Not too bad. How you doing, sir? And thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to to finally get a, kind of a face and face time with you. Um, I've followed you for a while and and whatnot. Um, not so big on YouTube these days, but uh, you're blowing up Instagram lately. So uh, I guess I can call you a an influencer if you <laughs> if you hate that term or not <laughs> but uh yeah so um just a quick introduction to to nick uh he runs um, a large social uh page on instagram but he also builds some of the biggest uh mudding off-road utvs uh and quads up up in canada uh, and you're out of alberta or ontario <laughs> No, I'm actually out of Ontario. Ontario, yes. okay. Um, yeah. And uh, so he's a big uh, BRP guy. He's got the he's got the defenders and the um, the maxes and all those other things going on up there. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But uh, if you can imagine the big tractor tires, the big mudding uh, setups, the portals, the uh, the big horsepower in this in the skeg, as you call it. Um, that's what he does. And uh, probably the largest muscular man in the world of UTV. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, why don't you give me a little background on yourself, Nick, and um, what you're doing up there. And, uh, yeah, just a little bit of an intro of yourself. Yeah, awesome, Zach. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, humbled by your intro. <laughs> it did me a, a service for sure. So um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are at in the world. My name is King Boss Quad, also known as Nick, uh, to my friends and family. Uh, I've been in the off-road world now for, I'm going to say pretty steady, about 15 years. So I'm 36. It kind of puts you uh, a little bit where it's at. It all started with um, my dad buying me a quad when I was uh, a young child and, and kind of starting from there, grassroots. And the obsession really kind of took root from there. Um, you know, I wasn't one of those people that liked to do a lot of distance. I was that one guy that found a pond in the backyard and absolutely buried my little Honda in there. And um, in doing that, you know, your dad kind of gets frustrated with you after a certain amount of time and says, you know what, you work on it. And that's when it became a bit of a passion around the mechanical side of things, which um, as anybody who follows me knows, I, I do a lot of my own wrenching and a lot of my own fixing. And I'm certainly not afraid to break any parts. I think uh, we um, all become a little bit more mechanically inclined when dad uh, throws the wrench at us and walks out of the garage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, I, I, I always, um, when I host a lot of rides and that's another thing that I do is I host a lot of rides up here. There's not a lot of venues. There's not any mud parks up here, um, that are worth talking about. Not like you guys have down in the States. So, uh, last year I decided that I was going to host rides on some of the local trails that I know where it was legal to go out and provide a safe environment. And you'll get these, you know, I call them the city folk, but it's really anybody that's newer to the sport. And I always welcome to come up and, you know, watching them enjoy themselves, but then watching them break something, whether it was major or minor and really teaching them, Hey, look, it's not the end of the world. The machine is designed to be off-road. It's not indestructible. It does require a little bit of respect. And this is an easy fix, whether it's doing a ball joint on the trail or bending a tie rod back and putting it back in place for them and just kind of bringing them along the evolution of that sport of, a fundamental understanding and respect of, Hey, this machine is not indestructible and neither are you. And so that's been really successful for me over the years. That's one of the biggest uh, storylines that I try to communicate to people when they get into the sport and they buy their first car and everything is learn your machine, respect your machine, know its limits, know your limits as a driver. Uh, and that may that may change over time and understand that it's going to change over time. But right now you're at a certain level where your machine can outperform you. And if you're not careful, you're going to break something destroy your machine, hurt somebody else, hurt yourself. Uh, and so that's like the first thing I always tell new buyers is get to know your machine, understand its throttle, understand its tipping points, you know, all the standard stuff that we would assume, you know, you would think about, but a new buyer won it. So, um, you know, when it comes to uh, the, like I'm, I'm more of an, uh, up in the mountains, trail riding, cutting new trail, and then maybe going to the dunes or whatever type of rider. Uh, those terrains have their very specific lessons to be learned when it comes to what you do mostly, which is a trail to the, the skeg or to the, the water or to whatever. Um, is there a different approach to that? Is there different things to learn in that scenario? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, 
each environment has its own challenges, right? And I'll, I'll say that anybody that is a hardcore enthusiast in each one of those different trains does suffer the same failures on the machines, right? Like I'll give you an example. A Can-Am X3 comes with foldable A-arms from factory. Yep. Whether you're in the dunes, jumping it, or you're going through some skag, those A-arms need to be replaced day one, first modification without blinking an eye, second modification on every single Can-Am and Polaris, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be your tie rods. Yep. Um, so if you're going to be aggressive, a little more aggressive than the machine was designed for, put larger tires on it, which most people do even in the dunes, some paddles, heavier tire set, that's that's going to be your, your second modification, right? So I would say as you start getting into more of the comprehensive mods around lifting it and making it wider, that's when you really start to get into the fundamental engineering of um, bracing the frame, understanding load on the side of a portal. Um, you know, we're really kind of breaking ground here at King Boss Quad, doing things that really nobody's ever done. We had the first six by six, uh, you know, max defender. You know, we bent our first frame. A lot of people didn't know this, but the reason why I went to the limited model was because the old frame actually bent literally just like this. And so the new one, we, uh, from day one ended up welding some gussets in there and, um, you know, we're sharing that wealth of knowledge with, with everybody, but, you know, to simplify your question, uh, it, it really is, um, the terrain is going to provide its own unique challenges. It's how hard you push that machine. Quite frankly, I think all of them do a decent job stock if you're going to drive them within their means, but, Everybody gets behind the wheel of a new X3. Heck, even I did it the other day. Absolutely for <laughs> this thing. And, you know, we dynoed it at over 200 wheel horsepower stock right out of the showroom floor. Really? They advertise that. I think it's in 190. 195. Yeah, 195. It dynoed to the wheel over 200 wheel horsepower, you know? Um, and we added some timing. We added some boost in that. And we ended up getting a number. I can't disclose it just yet. But, I mean, it's phenomenal what these machines can do. And to your point about respecting them, they are no longer your Honda 300 ATC no. where you got to shift your gears. These things will do zero to 60 miles an hour in sub three seconds. And oftentimes you're on terrain where you don't have the traction that's desirable. And if you don't have the experience to control something like this, you're going to get hurt. And that's something that I tell everybody all the time. And it's the confidence that those machines instill with the gas and the brake and the steering, that's going to get you in trouble. And a lot of times I've had to remove people from my riding group because they have kind of really put other people at danger as well as right. themselves. Right. And so I love that point that you brought up and it's respect your machine. And then the other thing is understand general maintenance. Right. Yep. And, and, so. and especially with your kind of, kind of, um, terrain and standard riding style, right. You're doing a lot of wet r submersive type riding and, yeah. you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is, uh, bearings and ball joints and, and that kind of linkage at the wheel. Right. And I mean, you guys aren't running stock 29 inch tires. You're running what? 36s. Um, the smallest tire that I have is a 36, no, a 34 on my Outlander, but that's, that's juice straight up to just skim over everything. I try not to touch the bottom. That's gotcha. the secret to that one. Um, <laughs> my X3s off. are, yeah, my X3s are all on 45s and the new one that I'm building is going to be 56s. So um, I saw that picture yeah. of your buddy standing next to that thing <laughs> yeah. and I shared it. I was just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's it, the, the game has changed. Uh, you know, I'd say about four years ago, five years ago, we went to mud nationals and I had one of the very first X3s. Actually, Dave Austin Cruiser got one, and I got one, an allotment from Can Am. And uh, we both brought them down to, um, uh, to Mud Nationals when we got there. And we had pretty much, there was three or four there total. And somebody had a brand new X3 lifted on, I think it was six inch portals and 40s. And he was still skimming the ponds. And I was always a huge. Uh, disbeliever in lifts. I thought that lifts would take away reliability. Uh, you know, this whole adage of you're gonna break your axle, you're gonna break your axle. Oh, first time everybody ever ran assassinators. I don't know the first people in Canada run assassinators, even before Asa Cruiser's entire crew. You know, they all love silverbacks or outlaws, which I would never even buy, even if you gave them to free. And, you know, even my dad's like, oh, you're gonna snap axles. I'll tell you what, it's all in your, your throttle, it's all in your right foot, and understanding the machine and how to load an axle up and when the terrain is, is not good um, to give it throttle. But I fell in love with lifts. And then it came, how do I make that lift reliable? And I think Super ATV has done a tremendous job with their new Gen, Gen, I think Gen 3 or Gen 4 portals. Right. I've never had a single issue. And I'm telling you, I have tested these portals high speed for long, long periods of time, tons of load, burying them as hard as I can, not a single bearing failure, not a single seal failure. These things have been absolutely rock solid. And then it's just some of the other components like their A-arms and their ball joints and all of that stuff. Now there is a secret sauce to a build. I'm going to be very honest with you. 
anytime somebody messages me on YouTube or Instagram or messages me on my phone, I will tell them exactly what that secret sauce is, particularly when it comes to defenders or X3s or renegades or outlanders, um, because there's an indestructible model out there. <laughs> do you, do you have concerns. that in your copy paste? Just that's like, <laughs> I do. Yeah, no, I, really do. I can send it to you right now. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like, if you're going to buy an X3, here are your 10 modifications that you're going to buy. I always ask what their budget is first, right? Cause right. you don't want to send them a list of, and then there's $10,000 of, of parts. It's going to turn somebody off. You can have just as much fun on a stock machine, but you have to learn its limits. Right. Yeah, and there's a lot to go into that too. And it, it, like you were saying, knowing knowing how to load up something or how to approach something at the right speed or the right RPM or how to load up your turbo if you're running a turbo car and and, and all those types of things and maybe some of the limitations a turbo has versus over an AA uh, in the mud or or whatever the train you're on. You know, it's 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 general maintenance at portals. <clears throat> the higher you go up and the bigger the tire you go, it's almost like putting an extension bar on a, on a, on a, it's a big pry bar trying to crack, right? Yeah. It becomes a big pry bar. And so for me, it's all about checking each one of those portal bolts and nuts almost religiously every ride. And it sounds like a lot of work, but then again, when I crawl through everything on my pressure washing times, half the time, it's kind of break even at the end of the day. Um, but I, I religiously check absolutely every nut and bolt on my portals all the time. I'll even go so far as taking the wheel off, taking off the, uh, the, the hub. Um, and then checking my my axle nuts because they back off too. It's a pretty right. known, known problem, right? So Loctite Red is your friend, man. <laughs> it's your friend. Are you a uh, are you a wheel bearing greaser or are you an anti greaser? Uh, anti greaser, yeah. if I'm honest. Yeah, I've actually never had any failures. I think a lot of that again comes down to the style of riding. You see a lot of wheel bearing failures when you ride a lot of ruts. Yeah, and people will go through ruts at accelerated speed. Um, I'm not in the business of, of abusing my machine unless I'm having fun. And I don't think riding ruts is fun. Um, I'd rather go around the ruts than, than kind of beat the, beat the snot of it. But also we're very fortunate up here in Canada where we don't have a lot of ruts. I'd have been to some of the mud parks in Texas where it's ruts or nothing. And that's where you're seeing a lot of these wheel bearing failures on a lot of the stock machines with portals. You do get rid of your wheel bearings just to kind of be very honest here. Um, so, where you're seeing a lot of that load becomes your ball joints. And right. so upgrading your ball joints to like a beautiful set of Kellers with some mud pins in there or the 3M compressions. Um, actually where we're seeing now, I call it generation three off-roading is uh, moving to like a three and corn, three, eight, three and inch, three and inch quarter Heim, like um, oh, okay. ball joints, yep. everything's a Heim joint. Right. And that way, I mean, you can replace them very easily on the trail, but they can take a half glove beating. Like we're literally moving into the age of where we're taking mega truck technology <laughs> right. and putting them into a, like our, our, our residential off-road vehicles. It's so. crazy how, how, I mean, pretty much every discussion you ever hear about this stuff, someone's always, it's crazy how, how much we've progressed in technology and in suspension and all that stuff. But it's, it's truly like an evolving, always current valid topic. <laughs> like it, every it, year it, it, it changes. Is. It is. And there's always that enthusiast who's built it better and done it better. And, um, you know, I always pull on them for their knowledge. For example, I remember when we were having issues back in the day with axle, axle dropout. Nobody in Canada knew what axle dropout was. They're like, why are your axles coming with the differential? This is super weird. Well, it's because we were so high with our lift. And we had so much weight on the outside that we went into a hole and, you know, suspension was dropping out. We were seeing, you know, these, these axles popping out and the solution was limit straps. Right. And so finding a vendor up here that we would do limit straps and then discussing with them what the length was. And I mean, there's a science behind it. When a limit strap gets wet, that's what happens. It stretches. Yep. So if you've got a quarter inch tolerance before your axle pops out, well, then you're pulling the axle out and then you're putting little um, seals around the pins and then you're putting the, the, the cotter pin or the, the, the cir circle pin back in the axle. And then you're putting, and that's going to give you a little bit more suction inside your diff. So these are all the little tricks and tips that I teach a lot of my friends and family and, and uh, subscribers because it's going to give them longevity in the ride. And, and so you're you're not saying that like everything should always be like super tight and sealed shut. You're saying like understand the compromise and 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 find the best solution for it because the axle dropout, you know, is is really kind of a fix, physics problem. You're not going to fight physics, but you can help it along by saying I understand the issue. I'm going to find a solution that I can meet with and then understand my limitations from that point. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And like there's guys that have done these tests out there and it's just about grasping them and, and talking to them. I mean, all of my knowledge has come from the guys in the deep South, you know, like Texas and, and, and Georgia and 
Um, you know, some really good friends down there like TCP Offro, PATV, these guys run bounty holes, you know, every single weekend. And they've seen all of these failures. And, you know, some people have different creeds that they align to and different religions that they speak to. But at the end of the day, we're all speaking the same language, right? Axle dropout is axle dropout. Limit straps are your solution. And, um, you know, whether it's 18 inches or 15 inches or 22 inches, it all depends. And it depends on your axle too. Do you have a double plunge axle like a, uh, like a Turner Eagle? or a gorilla, or are you going with more of a stock style axle that only has one single plunge on one side? Right. So this is the science that we get into. And a lot of people hear me talk and they go, how the heck do you do this and know this? <laughs> it's I because broke I've it broken <laughs> everything <laughs> religiously. And so over time, you just learn what works and what doesn't work. And you put this knowledge on other people. And so when I tell somebody, listen, you want a bulletproof X3, I need, you need you to buy the X3. I need $10,000 not including rims and tires to make that even more bulletproof. And you can go on the trail and you can have a fun day and not have any of these failures that we've had in the past. Right. And so that is the solution. Now I've seen people and I love this Hogwaller, one of my favorite mud parks to go to. I don't know if you've had the pleasure of going there, not yet. but every single night at two to three in the morning, we go back to our campsite and I, I call it kind of the, the walk of shame. It's the guys that are coming out of the woods at, two, three in the morning. I've seen Polaris razors getting towed home on the roof. <laughs> right. It's, oh, it's brilliant. We just sit there and we have a beer and we watch the wreckage come through. And you'll see guys that'll take these eight inch portals on a 10 inch lift, no axle straps, you know, just bought their machine, financed it for a hundred K and just absolutely go ham with it. And, you know, rip all three or four A arms off the darn thing, axles laying out. And the only way they can bring it home is flip it over on its roof and tow it on its roof. <laughs> and so, I mean, I've seen all areas and aspects of it. And uh, it's just a uh, hog is my favorite because no matter what, things go crazy at 12 o'clock there and everyone thinks they're a superhero. I think that's pretty much every <laughs> mud park. <laughs> it is. It is. Hey, I've been towed out. I've done the, I've done the walk of shame before. I'm not going to lie. I certainly have. <laughs> so uh, you have... So I, I kind of wanted to go back a little bit to kind of your riding area up there. Um, yeah. Down here in the States, you know, we're very region specific and state specific on where we can ride, how we can ride, what we can... Uh, defer off of and come back to things like that. Um, and each state's a little bit different and uh, you go out east and it becomes more private and not and less open like uh, BLM and stuff like that. So um, up in Canada, uh, what's the situation like there with riding? Is it all private? Is it kind of just country? Uh, is Canada running everything or is it um, maybe your, your territory that runs it all? And then what what kind of like limitations do you guys have in Canada? What kind of freedoms do you have up in Canada? Yeah, it's actually a really good question. I get this a lot, especially from new riders. So um, I would say the only thing you have to be cognizant of is your riding season. Um, up here during wintertime, we're very big on snowmobiling yep. and keeping trails groomed. And um, you do not want to take a quad or side by side down a groomed trail. That's a <laughs> pretty sure you'll get shot. <laughs> a big no, no. Yeah. I mean, a local snowmobiler will, will hunt you down yeah. <laughs> and have words with you. Um, so, you know, during the wintertime, there are quad trails up here and it's part of the OFATV, um, Ontario Federation of uh, all train vehicles, I think it's called, um, where they'll give you wintertime trails that you can go on and you buy a pass and you go. And really all you need is a green plate. So everything up here has a license plate that's off-road and it has to be licensed and insured. Insured. Um, so we are pretty strict around that and the police will pull you over and, you know, they'll ask for your license and insurance and they'll look for your, your trail pass. Um, during the summertime though, um, we have a beautiful region up here. Um, we have a ton of crown land. Crown land means that it's owned uh, legitimately by the federal government. And uh, there's a ton of just little local trails that you can go and bomb. You don't need a trail pass, uh, at least not to my knowledge. And you can go thousands of miles here. There's a massive trail system. Um, those snowmobile trails are also open in the summertime. Um, you just gotta be cognizant of not going through anybody's private land. Um, you know, do we have trail maps up? Look, I'll tell you the best day I have is a 30 mile ride. It's because it's, it's five miles to the mud pit and you know, you're doing 10 miles that way, 10 miles that way, and then five miles back out. And that's a good eight to 10 hour day. Right. Um, but if you want to cover some land, you could do thousands of miles here in a week. No problem. Um, you know, you're a police by the, the local law enforcement, like I said, for, for your, your trail pass, um, your insurance and your, you know, your permits or, or whatever. But other than that, I mean, pretty much the same local laws that you would, you would see. Um, and even up here, we're very fortunate where some of the uh, more rural towns actually allow for quads and side-by-sides. You can go to the grocery store or the liquor store, or even go to 
go to your your classes on an all terrain vehicle. Right? Yeah, that's one of the, the road. that's one of the big things down here is finding muni- municipalities that'll let you have a street legal side by side, and that's actually one of the biggest fights down here in the states is retaining uh, that ability and that freedom um, in certain uh, places. Like the big big one that we always bring up is Moab. It's it's the kind of the one that's hot in the in the news cycle right now, uh, where um, an influx of retiree type people are moving in and then trying to legislatively move. UTVs out of the out of the out of the city, right? Um, and unfortunately, you know, for us, it's it's a very slow grind to, you know, the the the, the defensive battle is always the uphill battle. the The accusation side is always the easy battle. So um, it is. That's that's kind of what we're fighting down here. Are do you guys have that kind of approach up the, up north, or is that pretty much just a, a built into the 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 culture up there? No. So it's actually, it's, it's highly applicable. So I, I bought this house that we're in right now, five years ago, and I bought it cause it was very rural. Um, I'm a very countryside. There's lots of ATV trails around here. Um, I'd say average age in this community is 55 to 65. So upwards to retirement, if not retirement. And then, you know, this young punk moves in myself, all these <laughs> and all side by sides <laughs> and all my friends. And, um, you know, I always tell this story of, um, about a year and a half ago when I bought my Sherp, I decided to take my shirt for a rip and you know, it's licensed, it's insured. It's, it's no different than a, an ATV. And uh, I went for a ride, came back an hour later and there was about 30 police officers <laughs> with high powered <laughs> rifles in front of my house, <laughs> pointing them at me. And I mean, I, I was terrified. And so I stopped, got out and they were very nice. And they're like, what the hell? is that um now were they I talking about your by your your body frame or were they talking about the shirt <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about the shirt uh actually the cop that uh, that was talking to you had it been six foot nine so oh, wow. I, I felt i swelled the wharf by him and uh they said listen we got called because one of your neighbors a little bit older complained about a tank going down tank. the road <laughs> yeah and so you know they reacted as such and like i said there was 30 30 units out here and then once i explained it to them and showed them what it was and showed them videos on my phone they were like okay you know have a good day and i, I park it in my garage you know it's it's safe and sound in there the tires down cruising in and off i go but what i've seen is an influx of that where you know even if you're you're snow plowing with your atv and you push the snow across the road you are seeing that older generation and calling and complaining. Now, keep in mind that some of my quads have straight pipe RJWCs <laughs> on them running nitrous. I don't disagree and I'm respectful, but that's why I've chosen to sell this house to move very, very, very far north where I'm literally on a trail system and I'm about to build a big shop house and uh, really drive this King Boss quad brand into the next uh, stratosphere. That's awesome. So, so get into the Sherp thing. How did you get into that game? Because I mean, that's a pretty niche group of people that one want them. Well, I guess there's a lot of us that want them. There's 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 a niche group of people that can can purchase them and then actually utilize them. And I think you know you and um, Asta and a bunch of other guys have, have definitely been putting them through their paces. And it, and it's and it's a funny vehicle because it's not even like in the American mindset or the North American mindset that these things even exist. It's kind of like a European ish type thing, right? It is. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. And I always tell the story. It was 20, it was either 2017 or 2018, uh, mud nationals. Dave had just got his first shirt pro, um, Austin cruiser. And, uh, it was end of the night. Now this is going back to where mud nationals was held in, uh, I think it was mud Creek off road, um, in, in Texas there. And so they had a beautiful party spot that was around this kind of muddy lake and getting in and out was always a nightmare. You were there for hours just waiting for the traffic to get in and out. Right. And I look through the woods and I just see Dave doing about 20 miles an hour (laughs) down this river system that had to be 15 feet deep. So nobody else could go through it. And I called him and I was like, Dave, you're kidding me right now. He's like, no, dude, you got to check this thing out. So the next day I woke <laughs> up, I mean, he got home two hours before I did do his campsite. And I said, take me for a drive. And he took me for a rip in the Sherp. And it is the G code for off-road. I will tell you, if I want to go have a day of fun, I will get in my ATV. I'll get in my side-by-side. It's challenging. The Sherp will take any terrain and laugh at it all day long. Um, so that's how I got into it was, uh, was, was Dave, um, and, and watching his videos and, you know, his passion for, for really 
off-road stuff and then just waiting for a used one to come on the market because <laughs> that market is so freaking small. Um, I waited about a year and a half. And then once one came up, again, even entry-level prices for Sherps used are you know in the six-figure range to be very transparent and uh, took a lot of saving and, and a, a lot of convincing of the spouse. And I jumped on the first one and I'll tell you, I haven't regretted that decision at all. It is the only tool set that I bring into the woods with me when I host my rides where I know for a fact, it's going to get me and everybody else out of the woods safely. And it has every single time. So for those that aren't uh, familiar with the shirt brand um, and, and on this, on this video version of the podcast, we'll have overlays of video and pictures and all that stuff. But, cool. um, but w- this is, what this is, is essentially, if you just imagine in your head, a large aluminum box on monstrous, <laughs> airbags of wheels um yes and uh anyways get get a little into the details of what you got going on there yeah, i mean so my, my sherp is, is is stock the only thing i have going on the back is a is a push bar um with some tiger tails on there just so that people can hook themselves up when i back up to them and have to get out anymore <laughs> just make um, them do it. That's it, but it's just a three-cylinder uh, Kubota turbo diesel motor. Doesn't make all that much horsepower. I think it's like forty-five or sixty-five horse. Um, it's a Renault five-speed tranny. Picture a skid steer, if you will, with giant five-foot tires that are three feet wide. Um, they have a central inflation system on there, so if you get really bogged down, you can go to zero psi or right up to as high as four psi. Um, it does a top speed of forty-five kilometers an hour, which I'm going to say is about thirty six miles an hour on water you're doing about three miles an hour so it's amphibious yeah um, so this thing will float based off of its tires and its and its payload it, it's so light that it can just float across whatever surface you have well even even the tires alone didn't provide the inflation it's um it's the actual hull it's a fully sealed hull um so actually last year we broke the world record in the largest open water crossing in my sherp oh really uh, we did yeah we did 15 miles and let me tell you it was um, was that a really did, uh, long 15 miles? <laughs> it was, it, it, uh, I think it took four and a half hours because there was a headwind. Oh, no. And so we just had it in fourth gear, absolutely pegged. And the thing's completely watertight. There was waves coming up over top of it. And, um, you know, we actually had the, uh, the local uh, police district out there kind of policing it, making sure that boats weren't going around making waves for us. It was really cool uh, to break that world record. But I mean, these things are the de facto off-road. And every time we take it anywhere, um, whether it's Canada or U.S., people, their mouths just drop because they can't believe something like this exists. And then you right. take kids out for a ride in it and, uh, you know, you, somebody's stuck and you pull up to them and they hook up on your front bar and just easily pull them out backwards. I mean, I've gone as far as pulling three giant razors stuck up to their steering wheels out at the exact same time um, from some skag. So that's, that's they, where that low just, end torque really pays off and having that that gripping surface. That's it. Yeah, that's it. They're, they're incredible. And I was actually telling a good friend of mine tonight, I had the Sherpa out this weekend and I had just turned it on his grass and his grass was a little bit longer. And he's like, oh, geez, you're going to kill my grass. And I said, give it two days. The grass is going to stand back up. Sure enough, you can't see where the Sherp went because it's got such a low um, center of gravity and it's got such a, a small footprint. I think it's like half a pound per square inch. Yeah. It doesn't disturb any environment it at all. It just lays it over. It does. That's it. So when you are in the Sherp, what kind of a different mindset is that? I mean, obviously you're going a lot slower, right? Um, do you, do you pick different trails or obstacles or do you just follow all your buddies through the same skag and same tight areas and, and inclines and, <laughs> and all that stuff? I am. Uh, so I, I like to challenge myself from my machine quite a bit, particularly in the Sherp because not much will. Uh, I will choose the juiciest, nastiest path with the Sherp, whether it's climbing over some rocks or some trees, um, going through the nastiest of mud or skag. Um, I've, and quite frankly, I've never gotten stuck. Yeah. Um, never. And we go through some pretty nasty stuff. So I, I will typically uh, be the individual that will go first because I like to film. I'll spin the shirt around. It makes it really great for doing what I do. I can open up the front window, take my iPhone, start filming. And then as people get stuck, I'll just drive right up to them, throw them a tiger tail, back up, pull them out, and next person goes. So um, for me, it's, it's anywhere I want to go. Uh, you know, you can drive over a tree this round, no problem. No effortless. Um, it'll climb over a rock that's four feet tall. So yeah, so it's an they're incredible pretty much machine. pretty much the only thing that could put them on their side or their back would be just an inappropriate hip 
angle of climb, right? Basically, you would really have to put some level of effort into uh, into tipping a Sherpa over. And I've seen Dave's videos where they did do it. And I, I would say that was probably like a 55 percent grade. So, I mean, you would struggle to walk up that. Right. Um, I, I'm not one of those hill climb type people. It scares the death out of me. I also hate <laughs> heights, so I'm not I would never put my Sherpa through those paces. Absolutely not. So, so you're scared of heights. Is that why you just rather go deeper than, <laughs> than higher? I can, I can swim. All right. <laughs> I've had two knee replacements. So I'm not very good at falling anymore. <laughs> oh man. So speaking of swimming behind you, you got quite the tank there. That's a, that's a, what, they a 200 do. gallon tank? I'd say it's like 220 gallon tank. I've got seven piranhas in there. The lights are all off right now. It needs a bit of a clean, but um, <laughs> for anybody that knows what I really do, I do have a real job. I'm just not a trust fund kid. Um, <laughs> And so I've been in software sales for about 15 years, quite successfully um, through some many mergers and acquisitions. Uh, I keep the piranhas for the days when it's three o'clock, it's a Friday. And all I want to do is quit. I spin around, I look at those and uh, it's the mindset of if you're not eating, you're going to be eaten. And that's all they know. Right. And so um, that's why I keep them in here. It's not a cool factor or anything. It's just my motto. It's my mindset. And uh, if anybody knows kind of the real Nick Fernet and what I do for a living and my employees that work for me, they'll know that's exactly what I am. And I think that's one of the things that drew me first uh, to the first few different posts that I saw that you you were doing. I think you do, you do a lot of, you know, face video stuff where you talk to the camera and, and to everybody out there. And, um, you have this real mindset of like, um, if it's, if it's not worth doing, then why are you doing it? And if you're going to do it, then do it 110%. Right. Um, and so that, that's definitely something. And I think anybody that's into, you know, well, so I, I've noticed this a lot in like el- upper echelon salespeople and, and people that are out there in front of people and talking to uh, those types of people and, 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 and bodybuilders and all these people, they're, they're just a high intensity, all in type mindset. And I, I don't think you can get to that level of performance if you, if you don't have that mindset. So it, it drew me in that like, you, that translates into what you do off road, right? Like you're not, you're not just buying a, 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 a UTV on credit and then acting like the big guys, like faking it till you make it right. Like you understand the complexities, you understand the investment, you're all in, you don't care. Like that's just the way it is. And we're going to blow through this and, and plow ahead. Right. So, um, how has that like changed maybe, or how is that different, a different mindset than maybe some of the other people out there that, um, you might take on some of these trips, right? Like what's the different mindset between understanding, I'm going to commit to this and, 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 and do it right versus I'm going to fake it and just kind of, you know, talk a big game and make sure I'm going to keep up with these guys. And then they're the, the one straggling behind. Yeah, no, I, I think that's actually a brilliant question. And I, um, I, I'll say first and foremost is um, I don't know everybody's story and I try and respect what I don't know about somebody. Right. Um, I've had a very tragic accident this year and it really did change my perspective of, yes, I'm this all in guy. I'm a very high energy. I do do everything. And I say 110%, 200%, whether you look at my physique or anything I own or anything I do or anything I put my time into, I, I, I am insane. And I know I am, I'm not a normal person. I had knee surgery three months ago. I'm squatting 600 pounds. It doesn't make sense. So when I have these people on the trail and they're net new to the group or anything like that, I try to just make sure they're safe. Honestly, that's like the biggest thing. I try to give them pointers. I try and make sure that, you know, they're going to get home with their machine safely. You know, I'm always that guy that's got the extra sweater or food if they get wet or cold. Um, I've taken jerseys right off my back and given them the new people. Um, but, you know, I've had people that, that come out and, you know, play this card of, you know, I'm super wealthy and I don't care about this machine and we're going to drive super fast and put everybody at danger. And quite frankly, we just don't include them in the next ride because that's not what the King Boss Quad brand is about. There's two things that you can do to kick them to my group. And it's an open ride, so I can't really kick anybody out, but I'm definitely not going to help you when you get stuck in your first hole. <laughs> the first is <laughs> put yourself or somebody else at danger and litter. Those are the only two rules that I have. You can go out and have fun and accidents and mistakes happen. Trust me, I've seen A-arms ripped off when you guys go around a corner and hits a tree a little bit too fast. That stuff's going to happen. Happens on the road, happens when you're walking down the stairs and you slip. Um, But, you know, I I try and go with a mindset of we're going to have fun. I want to make sure everybody has fun and I want to make sure everybody's safe. So, um, you know, to, to my motto, I I can't put that on everybody else. Um, Not everybody is, is Nick or King Boss Quad. Um, but in the same sense, I have the capability of helping and I have the capability of being helpful. And so I'll always try to make sure everybody has a safe and happy day. 
So you so you mentioned the 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 injury to your knee. Um, I believe that was a, a snow accident, right? I think you guys were up on the sleds. <laughs> It, yeah, it, it was um, January 2nd of this year. I was in a tragic snowmobile accident with my girlfriend, Megan, um, where she had missed a corner, um, not going particularly fast and um, sustained injuries that did take her life from her on February 2nd. So, um, you know, it, I, I'm not a big speed guy by any means and, and buying a snowmobile this year um, in my birthday in November, uh, we're certainly testing the waters and I didn't go and buy the fastest unit or anything. I just wanted to get out. Um, it was truly was a, a, an unfortunate accident that really changed my perspective on not only life, but other people's lives as well. And the impact you can have on somebody just by saying something nice or doing something nice. And that's why this year, um, a little more than last year, we've really dedicated the whole King Boss Quad brand to charity, whether it's donating money or our time, um, or doing some really cool things like working with sick kids, which is a local hospital here. You know, kids have been cooped up in these hospitals with COVID. Um, organizing a little parade with all of our off-road machines down the local street so they can sit at the window and just look at these cool machines, right? That is what the King Boss Quad brand has been rebranded of this year. Um, we've always been about being good and doing good. And so, you know, in light of that accident, in light of Megan's life, which was her motto and such an amazing person, um, that's what we're dedicating our entire brand to. Yeah. So you you kind of stepped, I noticed when this, when this all kind of settled down, right? When you started to uh, get back into physical therapy and, and get back to the kind of the quote unquote normal day to day of, of what you do, um, you really started getting and, and posting a lot about, you know, stop wasting your time about comparing and, and being the aggressor against somebody like really focus on how you can help and be a positive light. Um, and I think that's um, something that uh, our community, our off-road community um, really attaches itself to. Uh, it does. And, but there is a lot of um, influx over the last couple of years, especially this last year of people getting into our community that are from different um, backgrounds and different uh, cultures where they're a little bit more of the aggressor side. They're a little bit more of the conf confrontational side or, or um, the more party and leave it behind type guy. Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why we have some of these land issues down here in the States where we're losing access and, and things like that in the communities. Um, and we've talked before about it on our podcast a few times about it, but um, I, I, and, and in those conversations, I've talked about, you know, we have to be the better stewards of our community. We have to be the ones that are influencing and impacting those next to us in the community that aren't representing that, that mindset, right? Like for the most part, 95% of our community is willing to give you the axle out of their truck or to give you the belt out of their spare case or pull you out yep. of that hole or whatever, right? They're willing to go the extra mile for a fellow rider. But there is this, this growing um, niche in our community where they're more about their instant gratification and their their kind of like just their their Instagram posts or their story or whatever. Um, and so, uh, how do we as um, leaders in our communities, our individual little communities, our individual um, writing groups, our clubs, our Facebook groups, or whatever? Um, what what kind of ways can we be better to create that positive light uh, to them and, and be positive? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, it's, it's amazing. And I always tell this story. Um, I met Dave back in 2016, I believe it was at, at Mud Nationals. He had a brand new set of Gator Waders. It was when he was, it was, when he was sponsored by Gator Waders, not Finn Trail. Brand new. He, he looked beautiful head to toe. And this literally popped out of the box. And uh, we were having a chat. And about 100 yards over, um, somebody rolled there side by side in the water. Dave you know, the biggest influencer in this sport, as far as I'm concerned, was the first person underwater filling his hip letters up, ruined his phone, I'm pretty sure, just trying to get in there and help somebody. And that was the mentality that I took back then. It's still the mentality I have. I've got two broken knees. I'm the first in the water to help push. The, there's multiple occasions, even on Friday night, going down the trail, you know, stopping my shirt. It's not exactly the easiest thing to get into and out of, especially with two broken knees, you know, picking up trash and beer cans on the trail and just trying to lead by example. If we can get all the influencers, and I'm going to be very honest, we're very lucky in the sport where we have some tremendous influencers that are just genuinely good people that are able to do good. And if they continue to have those good acts and doing those good things, people are going to start to catch on. You can't change someone's behavior by saying, hey, man. Don't throw it out. You know what's going to change your behavior? Not saying nothing, walking over to that trash, picking it up, putting it in your trash can in your machine. Then they go, ah, oh, you know what? 
I do feel like a jerk. And he's doing this for a reason. He didn't say anything. But as soon as you go over and you say something to them, now it's a challenge. Now it's a conflict. And this is the mentality, the mindset that I was brought up with and why I'm so good at my job is, is just literally lead by example. And people will pick up by that. And, you know, Dave is the biggest champion of our sport. There is no question. He's an all around nice guy. He's the first to help. I've seen Dave stop out of his machine in the middle of a ride to pick up trash. I've seen him help people. I've seen him pull parts out of his bike to get strangers on the road. And so I just think lead by example and continue to do that. Yeah, that's definitely, you know, there's, there's a, a group of people that are just new and they're, they're a sponge and they're willing to soak up any kind of influence they can and knowledge that they can. Uh, and there's another group that are just, they're going to do what they're going to do. And so, like you said, I mean, we can, we can teach those that are sponges, but we have to lead by example with those that are uh, more of just on their own set trajectory and, uh, and be the better influencer there. That's, I mean, that's, that's what we can do is, is just lead by example. Right. Um, now, th there are occasions where, you know, you'll have a, a moment of negotiation when someone's, you know, stuck neck deep in their machine and you got your shirt and you can say, hey, I saw you litter earlier. I'll pull you out if you never litter again. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little roulette game. Uh, no, I, I don't do that. I'm always I'm always happy to help so, with so, any negotiation. So I'm pretty sure that conversation <laughs> starts with. That's a nice light bar you have there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that's why I do love hog waller is because the holes, all the, there, there's, there's no spinning. Like you'll get through everything as long as you've got the ground clearance, but there are some holes that are 10 feet deep. And if you don't have the rig to go through it, I mean, you're going to swamp and that's, it's, it's daily occurrence at hog waller. I've swamped several machines there myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's get a little bit more back into the machines. Um, what's your current fleet look like? I know that it kind of changed every year a little bit but it does i'm very fortunate where uh, i work very closely with um the local largest dealer here it's actually i think the largest dealer in canada lockhart's odyssey um you know the owner brad and the salesperson um uh, kevin and the service manager tony um they're always out there throwing new machines at me for a demo i think i was the first to to video a 2021 uh renegade xmr and and you know beat the snot of that it was super cool um, so my fleet always isn't exactly what I own. I can't tell you exactly what I own right now is I have, uh, I currently have three X threes. I just counted cause I just got another one the other day. <laughs> um, I've got two, two seaters XMRs and then one four seater XMR. Um, I have an outlander, uh, that's an 1180 kit on a ton of nitrous. I've got a defender max six by six, and I've got a renegade on order. So I don't know how many machines that is. It has four or five. <laughs> That's more than anyone's writing group has. <laughs> it it is it is, and I so um, I have different machines for different kind of mindsets or, or riding styles. Um, if I want to go low and slow, I'll hop in my uh, my lifted X three. Um, you know, if I want to go fast, I'll get on my Outlander. That thing is exhilarating. Um, it's insane. It's just designed to stay on top of everything. And, uh, you know, if I want to go, you know, party, I'll hop in my Defender 6x6. The sound system in that will blow the hair right off your head. Trust me, I have no hair on my head. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's I have different reasons for it. One of the things I'm a huge advocate of is bringing people with me. And so... Um, I've never had fun in my life ever being alone. I've never hopped on my seat and went for a burn myself. I'm like, oh, that was fun. Because you can't have stories and life's all about stories and selling is all about stories. And that's what I predicated my entire world on. And so everything I have is at minimum a two-seater besides my Outlander. And so, um, you know, it's all about bringing people along and new people along with this sport. One of the things that I've recently signed up for is working with Big Brothers Big Sisters, which is a large charity, uh, in bringing kids out in a safe fashion to come and, and ride some of these events, you know, kids that have been in the city their entire lives and have never seen Northern Ontario and bringing them out for a single day, having a barbecue with them and showing them, you know, Hey, by the way, this is how bad a mosquito can really bite you. <laughs> <laughs> this is how big they fly up North. <laughs> oh yeah. This, this time of year is really bad. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah. So, I, I've, I've seen a, a number of posts recently about, you know, taking some children out and, and having a good time. And I think that's a huge part of, the, the family dynamic, whether that be your family or an extended family through that kind of mechanism, right? And uh, there's so much that we don't, we get so focused on our jobs, on our day-to-day, -day, on our whatever it is. And then we schedule this like this three-day weekend out of the year to go camping or something, right? Like we get yeah. so focused on the pavement and mortar of the city that we, do, we, we completely forget about 
what mud smells like and what, you know, pine trees smell like and, <laughs> and, and all that stuff. And I think that is one of the huge things that drew me to this sport when I first got my, uh, my first razor in, in 2016 was this is a completely different sensory overload, right? Like you're, you're out it is. and, and it's, it's kind of like what camping is to the normal urbanite, right? Like you're, you're getting out in the woods and you're smelling and you're hearing and you're doing it. And then you're doing it now at like 60 miles an hour or at, you're doing it at, you know, whatever out in the middle of well, it. Get, you're getting to remote locations. That nobody's really ever been in a long time, you know, some beautiful it's, scenery, it's, dead quiet. And it, it's the experience. It's like you were saying the story, right? You're out with somebody doing something that you don't normally do that people don't normally do. And, and, and you have these stories that other people can, you know, I don't want to say you can gloat over them or, or, or whatever, but you kind of sit in awe and listen to those stories and wish that you were out doing it. And I think, you know, that's what really drew up, makes making this industry explode beyond the badass looking cars, right? Like we have some pretty cool looking things, but the, the, the actual experience when people like, like when the, when they have the, the Jeep versus UTV argument, right? Like, yeah, you can have a Jeep and you can go drive it to the mountains and you can have that experience, but that's no different than driving in your Honda down the street to go downtown to get a hot dog. Like it's, it's listen, I, I challenge, and I get in arguments with all these Jeep enthusiasts all the time. Uh, you, you give me your best Jeep. You could spend, I'll give you a million dollar budget, your Jeep. I'll take a stock X3 and I'll go further in any terrain you possibly imagine. They do not compare. It's not, there's no comparison. Um, you're absolutely correct. You get such remote locations in these new off-road vehicles and with such ease and such speed that, you know, you get to experience things that nobody else has ever experienced. Um, to your point about the love, the smell of mud, 2018 Can-Am commercial, that was my one line in the commercial. <laughs> I love the smell of mud. <laughs> That's what I said. That must have been a subconscious <laughs> callback. <laughs> it was actually it, in, in shooting that commercial. Um, there's always the, this like one moment in the sport you take away from you. It's, it's the, the one that you revisit every time you break all your axles and it's three in the morning and you're stuck in the woods is your, your passion for the sport. Right. And um, I remember shooting this commercial. It was getting really late in the day. It was Texas. It was super hot. And if you've ever been to Texas, you'll know the mud is fairly red and we were riding um, all renegades. So we recovered head to toe. Everybody was tired. Everybody was grumpy. And uh, we got out of the mud and I couldn't tell who was who at the end of the day. <laughs> there was 10 of us. And at that moment, it went through my head. It was, geez, at this moment, it doesn't matter where we're from, what color you are, what religion you are. We all just had a hell of a day. And all we wanted to do was crack a beer and just sit back and talk about the good times that we had. And that's really what predicates a good off-road group and a good off-road community is the passion for the sport. Nothing else matters. Nobody asked me what I do for a living when I'm out off-roading. And that's my disconnect. It's my moment to walk away from my stresses of the day. It's a moment to walk away from whatever religion or problems I have in my life. It doesn't matter. All that matters is getting through that next hole, helping your fellow friend out and laughing about it on the other side. And so that is what I revisit. And that is the passion that I revisit often in this sport. And that, that kind of harkens back to kind of like some of the trips that we've taken this last year. We went through uh, the, what we call the Idaho BDR, which is from Nevada to Canada border um, oh, that's cool. on an overlanding trip. And, you know, obviously there's a whole element of just being with your buddies and, and having to traverse a full day's ride. Right. But there's this other element of it where you stop at these little towns and you see these little, you know, communities and niches of people that are completely unaware of your life and unaware of what you're doing. And, and this thing that you're driving looks like a UFO and like, <laughs> like it's just a completely different sensory overload for them and for you because there it's a, it's a deprivation of sensory on them, your perspective of them. And then they're seeing an overload of, of what you're bringing to the table. So there's a lot of interesting conversations there. There's a lot of interesting experiences that you just don't have unless you're jumping into one of these cars getting out on the trail and, and doing it. Like, I, I think that, um, and, and I know the OEs are, are thinking the same thing, like with some of their strategies they're doing right now, it's about going further, pushing yourself further because this stuff's not hard anymore. Like you don't, you don't have to live like a caveman to go into the mountains anymore. Right? Like you're not the weirdo with the six foot beard and the walking stick that lives in the middle of the woods anymore. Like you can says just, the guy with the six foot beard. It <laughs> <laughs> says the most identical beard in UTV. So, um, but I think that's the thing is like, that's what draws us. And that's what that makes us keep going back is when we can go further, deeper, farther, longer, you know, all that. And I think um, if is. more of us took that mindset, you know, we would have so many more stories to tell. We'd have so many more experiences. Basically we, our lives, we would live our lives in a much better, 
happier, um, satisfied way versus just grinding and grinding and grinding. That's right. It's, you know, it's all about fulfilling that sense of adventure and we all have it. It's instilled in each and every one of us as a human being. And so uh, I think the OEs have done a great job in enabling that with some of these amazing machines. I don't care what brand you're loyal to. Um, I'm loyal to, uh, to BRP, to Can-Am. I think they're all wonderful machines. And at the end of the day, you know, if it's going to get you from point A to point B safely, which they all do very well, um, it's, it's all about having fun. And um, I think that they've done a great job with that. So let's give our our, our community a little um, uh, some takeaway here. Let's do let's say let's do King Boss Quads top five recommendations when you buy a brand new vehicle. Um, you get we got a lot of these people coming into the community right now. Uh, they're buying you know Can Ams, Polaris's, whatevers. Um, they're some of them are going all in and, and buying lift kits and they're buying big tires. Um, some of them are doing it in a uneducated way where they're just buying 35s and putting them on stock OEM axles and hubs and all this other stuff, no clutching. So if we were to say uh, King Boss Quads, top five recommended, consider this to buy when you buy a car, get into the sport type things, what would you do? Yeah, not hard. Are we going quad or side by side? Because we're going to so, go to different so avenues. So we're a UTV podcast, so we're going to stick with UTVs. But if you want to throw some side quad in sides. at the end, I'm good with it. Okay. No, no, totally fair. So um, I'll just take an X3, for example. Um, and this is kind of specific to really even the, the Polaris is uh, top five arms. Get rid of the stock ones, go with some S3s, super ATV, high lifter. I don't care what they are. Um, something that's a decent Dom steel, all joints. Stock ones are good, but if you're going to ride the pants off of that thing, trust me, a ball joint failure is critical and also incredibly dangerous ball joints. Tie rods, absolutely imperative. You know, um, you're going to ride the pants off that. You're going to bend a stock tie rod in in in, in no time. Um, this is for all machines. Fourth is radius rods, so your rods in the back that connect your tires. Um, the stock ones, you'd be so shocked how um, useless they really are. You bend one of those, <laughs> right. it's gonna it's gonna ruin your day. And then fourth and final, again applicable to all machines, a spare belt and knowledge on how to change one. Um, you know, many times I'll see these guys pop out beautiful machine, all the right modifications, you know, they blow a belt early on in their day, their day's ruined. Um, and you (laughs) know, if you had a, you had a spare belt somewhere in your machine at 20 minutes, you're back on the trail. They're all designed now to come off very quickly, go on very quickly. Um, so those are the top five modifications in less than three minutes that King Boss Quad would recommend to really any UTV. I think, I think that's a great list. And, and, and it's funny that you bring up the belt thing because there's so many times where it's like we've come across somebody what are you what are you up to why are you why are you looking at your car oh well, the, we heard a big squeal and then we smelled a bunch of smoke and like it won't move <laughs> it, like i don't it just every time i push the gas it just cries like i don't know what's going on um that's actually one of the like if i should i should, I should really actually just do a video or write up on this like the top 10 things you should know about getting into the sport but um Maybe a belt should have been number one. I should, I'm going to change <laughs> my life. That's definitely number one. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, That's critical. The, one of the first things I tell people is, is take the time, walk around your car, know what everything is, get familiar with yep. the sizes of the bolts and the, and all that kind of stuff. Just so you know more about your car and how to respond, but practice a belt change. Like it seems so stupid to, to recommend going into your garage when you, when you bring it home and you're out in the garage, drinking your beer, going, yeah, that thing's badass. Like at that moment in time, set the beer down, pop the clutch cover off, figure out how to get the belt off, figure out how to put it back on because that will save you probably about two and a half, three hours of time when you're on the trail trying to figure oh, out yeah. how to spend, <laughs> swap your belt. And I, and I think yeah. the, 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 the dealers uh, need to push the, the spare belt thing a little bit. It just seems to be built into the, in the cost of buying the car is that you get a second belt with the car. <laughs> what I noticed with the new commanders actually, um, cause I had to do a test drive on one the other day is, um, in the bed sides, they come off and there's actually a spot where your belt and the belt tool can sit in the OEM spot, which I think is brilliant. I think that's something that Polaris, Can-Am, Kawasaki, Honda should, or Honda's Honda's in their own (laughs) world. (laughs) Should have never said that. Now I look like an amateur. Um, That they should really push because you are right. It'll ruin your day real quick. And, um, you know, I'll say the OBs have done a great job in keeping their belts. I'm going to tell everybody something. All my X3s and all my machines besides my lender are on stock clutches and stock belts, Maverick belts. They perform flawlessly. And anybody that's out there that's going to tell you you need to clutch it, listen, I'm running 45s. You put me in the stickiest of Vicky, it's going to turn them no problem. I think they've done a great job on the X3 and Defender platform with stock clutches. And unless you're getting into some bounty holes where you really got to start spinning those big tires, 
stock clutches work well. So these stock rigs work well. I took a brand new XMR out on Saturday night. I was blown away by how capable it was. And sometimes you don't have to bolt on the big tires, you know, but um, those are King Boss Quad's top five recommendations, <laughs> switching it around, putting the belt first, understanding how to change one <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and, and one of the, one of the other things is, is, is a solution, whatever solution you want on how to repair your flat tire when you blow the first one out on the first or second trip. Okay, I'm not going to give you my solution. It's very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it comes with, that comes with a lot of experience, a lot of ether. Um, yeah. But a you plug know, kit or a spare or something like you just uh, until you're confident with your machine, you have enough experience on your belt to go out without something uh, to replace it. You know, take a jack, take a spare, whatever plugs, air compressor, air so- source yeah. of some sort, and, and know how to approach that situation because I, I think a large majority of, of first time owners either cuts one or blows a tire on their first couple rides up, up here. We, we, we don't see a lot of blown tires because of the soft terrain. Um, you know, I, I see two things. One is not understanding the difference between high and low in the terrain that it should be in. Right, um, right. I'm 99% in low, 99% in low. My bikes, my, my, my machines are barely in high gear um, because of the terrain. And two is, you know, I watch all these yahoos come out and do donuts you have no idea how dangerous donuts are. I've seen a hundred percent of people, including Mark Freeman, who is the donut master, <laughs> flip his machine over on its roof because uh, although they do them really, really well, it's that one that doesn't do really, really well. And you're going to be really upset with yourself when you rip your mirror off, smash your windshield and crush your roof because you right. did a donut. I, I do not recommend donuts. I was Sorry. talking to a, um, a nurse um, at one of the local uh, hospitals out here in the more rural area of where we live. And she, we were talking about UTVs and what I do for a living and, and all this other stuff. And she was saying, yeah, we get probably two or three people a week that, you know, had their hand out a window of one of these things or, you know, put yes. their foot out to I catch saw themselves. I posted that on Facebook the other day. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah. it's a real thing. Like, I don't understand. Like, you look at, you mentioned the Honda. They're really, like, it comes with window nets. Like, I think there should be some real consideration for the for the manufacturers to think about the possibility of including window nets into their cars because... Almost everybody, myself included, when you start tipping over, the first thing you want to do is is to support yourself, yeah, put your hand yeah. out. Um, if you have a, a vehicle that doesn't have like full doors or a, or a half door to stop you from putting your leg out, you kind of want to to try to prop it up or or do, do. even the guys in the, that are doing rock crawling, right? Like they're they're going up these 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 obstacles and then it starts getting off camber and you you can see them like reaching and then pull their hand back in or or whatever. And they're not even going fast. Um, so there's definitely some, some serious education that could be there. Um, part, I don't know if there that is. should be like from the dealer or if that should be like online or, or whatever, but keep your hands in the car and don't put yourselves in situations where you feel like you're going to have to support yourself in some sort of situation like that. Yeah. I say, you know, number one rule when you crash, just keep your hands on the steering wheel, push your head back as tight to your seat and make sure you got your seatbelt on. Right. Um, yeah, I, I go slow. It's rare. I put my seatbelt on. I'm doing two miles an hour through the mud and I'm probably going to drown if I have it on. Um, <laughs> right. Pick your terrain in your battles. Um, I love watching the side-by-side blog guys. They've done a great job of talking about safety and performing it themselves. I think there's apparatuses out there now that will actually keep your hands um, attached to the steering wheel or close to it um, yep. just for that particular reason. Um, and yeah, we see it up here all the time. You know, somebody goes and gets a, a brand new machine, comes ripping down, does a donut, flips on its roof, puts her arm out and breaks their arm. It's a really crummy way to kind of start and end your weekend. For sure. So uh, I think that uh, that's just where having a good communication mechanism in our communities and our writing groups and our families like, hey, let's just take two seconds before we head out and talk about what we're going to be doing. Like, let's just all think about what we're doing. And if there's a situation, this is how we respond. This is the phone numbers we need to call. You know, who's got the GPS? Who's got this? Who's got that? And, and make sure that everybody understands the scope and the uh, and the response mechanisms in situations. Absolutely. Always ride with uh, somebody else. That's my other recommendation is never ride alone. Yep. Um, anybody that rides alone is putting themselves in peril, um, useless peril. You know, we all love to do it, but um, you'll never see me ride alone. There's always another machine with me. So uh, something I ask pretty much everybody this year about, you know, just kind of the transition from last year's craziness to, you know, this year's transition kind of year. Uh, what are you looking forward to the most uh, in 21? Build out of my shop to be able to do the King Boss Quad thing full time and, and build some mega machines. Um, you know, I, 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 like you said, this this whole uh, genre that we're in, um, the off-road community, is, it's exploding. People are starting to realize that there's another world outside of Xbox, PlayStation, and TV. 
um, and, and getting out there. And it's great for us. And if, if we can show them the right way of doing things and do some cool things on the way, um, that's what's got me most excited. Um, you know, there's some huge influencers in there like Dave that are doing some amazing things with the OE brands and pushing them, you know, to, to do things. For example, the locking differential with Can-Am. I'm pretty sure that was a brainchild of, uh, of Dave pushing them saying, listen, Visco locks absolutely suck. Every other manufacturer has a better diff than you. We need a locking differential. Two years later, the locking differential came out. So, you know, 2021 is, is all about, first of all, being able to ride. We're still locked down up here in Canada and it's really kind of killing our vibe, but, um, you know, pushing the limits every single year on the OE manufacturers, the aftermarket manufacturers like Super ATV and PATV, um, and just bringing as many new people to this sport and teaching them, you know, proper etiquette and safety. That's really it. And I think part of that is, is like that leading from example, uh, part of it is like, don't hesitate taking somebody out on the trail. Like, don't hesitate being the lead, like show them a good time, show them the safe way to do things. And like Absolutely. over, over where we're at, you know, there's, you know, you travel a little ways, you can get to some sand dunes and things like that. There's a whole different mentality, like coming out of the mountains to go to sand dunes. There's a whole different oh, yeah. set of things to look out for. There's a whole different like rule set of like how to behave on the dunes and where to ride, what side, how to approach things. Like we just need to do a good job as a community show them a good time, show them a safe time and, and be a positive influence so that they can continue to have that, that experience. Brilliant. Well said. Uh, so yeah. Um, how can we find you online? Where can we see what you're doing and um, maybe participate in some of the terrible things that you're doing? <laughs> yeah. So right now I'm pretty much pushing Instagram only King boss quad, um, King boss quad official. Uh, we kind of took a little bit of a break from YouTube just because uh, of my personal situation. I just didn't have time to edit videos or shoot videos, but we're going to get back on that at late this summer. Um, otherwise I just still get a lot of uh, content out of Mark Freeman 408's YouTube channel. So he does a lot of filming and editing for me, um, on his stuff, but, but, uh, just hit me up on Instagram. I have, uh, dedicated my time to replying to absolutely everybody. And I do do that. So if you have ever any questions, comments, concerns, I'm happy to share my knowledge or just say hi. And if you want a little bit of that King boss quad secret sauce that he talked about earlier, you can hit him up there and, <laughs> and say, copy paste me your solutions. So I got um, ready to go. <laughs> well, great. Uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to to join us on the podcast. And uh, it's always fun to have somebody from across the border join the podcast, too. So uh, Canada represent today, I guess. And um, we've talked a lot about <laughs> personalities from the north uh, today. So, um, yeah. So uh, everybody listening, uh, you can find him at King Boss Squad on Instagram um, and uh, follow his YouTube channel uh, just in case he starts posting again. So you can find <laughs> us on uh, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Google. Uh, you can find us on all the different streaming platforms. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.